Hi, everyone. In this video, I'll be going over the existential theory. All right. So this theory focuses on exploring themes like mortality, meaning, freedom, responsibility, anxiety, and aloneness as they relate to a person's current struggle. Because of this, it can sometimes be perceived as pessimistic, but it's not meant to be. This approach is unique in that it confronts these so-called ultimate concerns in a frank and honest manner. Note, however, that therapy from an existential approach is not a set of techniques, but rather a means of understanding what it means to be human. Therapy must balance the limits of human existence with the possibilities and opportunities of human life. Accordingly, this video will not be stressing um, techniques and strategies. Some basic assumptions. First, humans are free. Therefore, we're responsible for our choices and actions. We are not victims of circumstance. Second, existence is never fixed. We continually recreate ourselves through our projects, and we evolve and adapt based on our experiences. We are constantly in a state of transition. And finally, being a person implies discovering and making sense of our existence. Now some key concepts. First, the dimensions of the human condition. So these are all listed here, and I'm not going to read them because I'm going to go through each one in separate slides. So we'll start with the capacity for human awareness, which is seen as the first dimension of the human condition. All right, so self-awareness includes awareness of alternatives, motivations, determinants of behaviors, and personal goals. It is at the root of most other human capacities, and we can choose to expand our self-awareness or restrict it. Clients who choose to expand their self-awareness will gain knowledge about various things, including the ability to learn from the past and shape the future, the realization that preoccupation with suffering, death, and dying prevents appreciation of living, and the realization that preoccupation with the past or with planning for the future or doing too many things at once keeps you from living in the present. There are some important implications here for therapy. First, increasing self-awareness is absolutely a goal of therapy, but know that it comes at a price. Ignorance of one's condition may have brought contentment, but turmoil can be expected with increased awareness. Nonetheless, it is through this turmoil that life can become more fulfilling. Next, freedom and responsibility. So the greater our self-awareness, the greater the possibilities for freedom. We have the freedom to become what we want within the context of our limitations, and we are responsible for the choices that we make. We have the capacity to reflect upon our choices and make better ones. However, a central existential concept is that we avoid freedom by being inauthentic. That means that we see ourselves as static entities and avoid choosing or make excuses for non-preferred choices rather than accepting that ultimately it was our decision. Implications for therapy? The therapist is going to help the client discover how they're avoiding freedom and, and encourage them to accept it, to live authentically. For example, some avoid freedom by allowing others to decide for them. So taking ownership of that decision-making of those choices would help them to live authentically. Clients also need to explicitly accept that they have choices and take the risk of taking control over those choices. Remember that even though we can't control everything that happens to us, we can control how we perceive and handle what happens to us. Also note that existential guilt may arise when clients become aware of having evaded a commitment or having chosen not to choose. This guilt isn't bad though. It can serve as a powerful source of motivation towards living authentically because the client does not want to feel that anymore. Next, striving for identity and relationship to others. Humans strive for personal identity and uniqueness while at the same time striving for connectedness with others. So it's like creating a balance. But rather than trusting ourselves to figure out how to do both, we sometimes turn to others and try to become what they expect of us. With personal identity, clients may fear that they might discover their only reflections of everyone's expectations of them and not actually anyone for themselves. But by helping our clients face the fear that their lives are empty and meaningless, therapists can help clients to create a self that has meaning and substance that they have chosen. With connectedness, the sense of isolation comes 
from realizing that we can't depend on anyone else for our own confirmation. We alone must give meaning to our own lives and we alone must decide how we live. This is why we struggle with fitting with the experience of just being. Instead, we get caught up in doing mode to avoid being present with ourselves. If we can't tolerate ourselves alone, how can we be enriching to others by being in their presence? You must love yourself before you can love others. As with the others, this has important implications for therapy. First, confronting, oops, sorry, got my notes messed up. First, helping clients to examine the ways that they've lost touch with their identity and how they've allowed others to design their lives for them is a central task of therapy. Then, learning how to listen to oneself and creating a self that has meaning to you. For the social component, we help clients to distinguish between dependency and a life-affirming relationship where both people are enhanced. Right? We don't want dependency, we want a life-affirming relationship. So we can ask clients what they get from relationships, how they establish intimate contact, and whether or not they actually have equal relationships. Next is the search for meaning. So this approach provides a framework for helping clients challenge the meaning in their lives. In some cases, the values that people have adopted have been blindly accepted because they're all that the person's been exposed to. But these values aren't personally meaningful. We can see this sometimes with religion, with folks that have been raised around a certain religious uh, set of values and beliefs, and then they realize that they don't actually mean anything to them because they were just kind of thrust upon them, right? In other cases, values might be abandoned, like in the example of religion, but not replaced with something meaningful, leaving the client with anxiety. So perceived meaninglessness, meaninglessness of life is one of the major causes of existential neurosis, wherein a person wonders if it's even worth continuing to struggle and live. This meaninglessness can also lead to emptiness and hollowness, which Frankel calls the existential vacuum. Some implications for therapy. In therapy, we're gonna help clients to create a value system that's based on a way of living that's consistent with their way of being. Note that meaning is not something that they can discover once and check off their list though. It is an ongoing process that we'll struggle with throughout life, but we can help clients to adopt a set of beliefs and values that is meaningful for them as opposed to one that they just accepted blindly. Next, number five, anxiety as a condition of living. So existential anxiety arises from confronting the givens of existence. That those are death, freedom, choice, isolation, and meaninglessness. Confronting these things fills people with dread. For some, this may tempt them to ignore reality and fail to make decisions. For others, it can lead to a fixation on the issue and being driven to a state of neurosis or psychosis. So we need to strike a balance, okay? Um, between being aware of the issues and being overwhelmed, right? We don't want to not be aware, but we also don't want to be super overwhelmed by them. So by being aware but not overwhelmed, we can make decisions that impact life in positive ways. So implications. Existential anxiety, it's a part of living with awareness and being fully alive. You kind of need it. Facing it, though, involves viewing life as an adventure rather than living in denial. So the therapist can help the client to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty while also becoming more confident. Okay, and number six, awareness of death and non-being. So awareness of death is seen as a good thing according to this approach because it gives significance to life. It should not be considered a threat, but rather as a motivating factor that helps us to live fully. We don't have an eternity to do everything, so we have to live in the moment. Some, impl it, some implications, confronting fear of death can help clients to live authentic lives. Awareness of death can also help clients to evaluate how well they're living and what changes they need to make. Finally, death means that our actions do count, we have choices, and we have the ultimate responsibility for what we do with our lives. So with these uh, basics in mind, the therapeutic process then is influenced accordingly. So there are um, a couple of phases of counseling here. There is no formal assessment in the approach, um, but therapists are concerned with understanding the subjective view or subjective world of the client. So therapy progresses in three phases. In step one, 
the therapist is trying to understand how clients perceive and make sense of their existence. So this is where we're looking at values, beliefs, and assumptions, um, and determining where they came from and whether they're meaningful for the client. Part of this is moving away from blaming external causes and looking more internally at how they're responsible for their actions or inaction. In step two, we're helping clients to engage in self-exploration to identify their value system. This helps clients to identify what kind of life they consider worthy of living and to develop an understanding of their internal valuing process. And then in step three, we're taking what this client is taking what they learned and applying it behaviorally, which involves using their strengths to work toward a purposeful existence. Your role as the therapist is to understand and explore the client's subjective reality rather than coming up with a diagnosis, treatment, or prognosis, or your own interpretations of what's going on. There is no traditional medical model of doctor and patient, or in this case, therapist client. Rather, the therapist and client are seen as fellow travelers. The therapeutic relationship provides a deep human relationship to explore together the difficulties of human interaction. This involves helping the client to see ways in which they are restricting their awareness of death or of freedom, for example, and the cost of these constrictions. By engaging in self-confrontation, the client can then accept responsibility for changing their future themselves in a meaningful way. Based on this approach, symptoms come from a struggle between wanting to grow and being comfortable or complacent with not growing. Further, you may experience anxiety when you confront ultimate concerns. Some of the goals of existential therapy are to assist clients in exploring the existential givens of life so they can live a more meaningful existence. We also help clients to become more present to themselves and others, so living in the moment, which involves identifying the ways in which they block themselves from being present. We're also helping clients to face anxiety and to use it as a motivation for living. And we're helping them to accept responsibility for their role in creating their life predicaments and changing them. And finally, with developing authenticity by taking responsibility for their actions and the way they're living. Remember that there are no specific existential techniques. You're welcome to use techniques from other diverse orientations, so long as they're authentic for you as the therapist. The relationship is what is most important. The I vow relationship stresses direct, mutual, and present interaction. Instead of being objective and blank, you should try to create an authentic, caring, and intimate relationship with your clients. This means that focusing so much on interventions and what you're going to do or say is detrimental because it keeps you from being present. Some strengths of this approach is that it can be very empowering by emphasizing self-determination, autonomy, freedom, and responsibility. Therapy is also unique to the individual client and doesn't stress interventions that may make the therapist not be present in the session because they're so worried about doing or saying the right thing. And it allows for exploration of life's deep questions, like what is the meaning of life? Limitations. The existential therapist needs to have done their own work therapeutically so that they're present and not clouded by their own unprocessed issues. There is also little empirical evidence for this approach since it doesn't have specific intervention. And finally, it can be difficult to implement with lower functioning clients or those in crisis. That is the end of this video. Let me know if there's anything I can clarify for you or if you have questions about this approach. Thank you for listening.